Okay, you guys, I'm so excited for this episode. I'm so excited for our guest, Talia Bambola. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Seeing Other People. Thank you. I am a longtime listener, first time guest, I guess is how I would say it. Uh, And I remember seeing your podcast and I was like, I got to get on there one day. And I talked to my media person and he's like, let me see what I can do. And I was like, perfect. And so when I got your email and your like DM, I was like, this is amazing. I think I said you, I was like, I love your podcast. Like I would love to be on it. So I'm very excited to be here. (laughs) I'm so excited. It's so funny because I've been trying to figure out how to introduce you. And I feel like you're so many things and you have such an impressive like (laughs) title. So I'm going to try and do it. First of all, you're known as the confidence and assertiveness specialty specialist, which is amazing because we need a lot of help in that area here. Yes. Yes. (laughs) You're a psychoanalytic, licensed marriage and family therapist, a professor and a speaker, and you have your master's degree in clinical psychology, and you're a certified psychodynamic psychotherapist and host of Heal Through Humor. Yes. And I don't know how I do (laughs) all that I do. Um, And I I joke with my other podcasts, I'll joke, and I'm like, I would have never started all of them if it were now. Like The fact that they've been going for years is the only reason why I've kept up with them and the fact that I love my co-hosts, but it's a lot of work. I mean, you, you know, you do this too. It's, that is like a job in and of itself if you wanted to. And then I look at all that I've done and I'm like, wow, I was really ambitious when I was deriving my self-worth from productivity. Like, okay. (laughs) And then I, I think also noticing some like changes after, I don't know if other, I'm sure other women will listen to this too. After I got off birth control, that was a huge shift for me hormonally. Cause I feel like I was so driven, almost like man drive. And then once that shifted, I was like, I'm lighter and more free and I don't need to work as much. And then I was like, yeah, I'm so glad I built all of this beforehand. (laughs) Oh my God. That is so interesting. That's something I haven't thought that much about. I, I've been on birth control since I was in high school and it was like before I even like had sex for the first time, but I was, I had such bad periods. I was like, I can't, Uh, I can't live like this. I have a period for half the month. I can't, I can't do that. Um, so I've been on birth control for like half of my life and eventually one day I will go off of it. And I've, I don't, I haven't really thought about how it might affect me other than getting my period. <laughs> yeah. I was on it for 15 something years trying mm-hmm. to do the math. Yeah. So it was a very long time and nothing like everything came back right away, but I noticed a huge shift in my drive and I also had accomplished yeah. so much. I didn't need to get as much self-worth from work. So I think it was like a kismet mm-hmm. timing thing. Uh, but that is, that is a huge shift that I noticed in my professional life too, that I was like, okay, I'm noticing this with other people. How many of my clients are also deriving self-worth from how productive they are, how much they've achieved? Are their parents proud of them? Like a lot of that, I think classic millennial psychology that the, that our parents for the most part, I don't know if yours did really instilled in us, like be proud of yourself, but also do something that makes us proud. And it's like, okay, but what if it's not what you want me to do? And how am I going to wrestle and grapple with that? And that's a lot of the, that and and the dating and anxious attachment is a lot of what I talk about with my clients. Yeah. I, I feel like I I don't worry as much about making my parents proud. I think like I went down a a very bizarre path. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to not going to let go for my job. Not going to apply for jobs. Just going to like figure it out. And they were like, cool, like, great. We believe in you. But I definitely put so much pressure on myself where like, if I don't check everything I need to do from my to-do list off in a day, like I feel badly about myself. I'm Mm -hmm. like mad Mm -hmm. at myself. Or if I don't take Barkley to the dog park or go work out in a day. I'm like, well, this day was not successful. Yeah. It was wash. Yeah. 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 And I, I think having a to-do list, if it's, if it's things we already do, it can help us feel really accomplished. So if it's like brush teeth, I know I'm going to do that. Yes. (laughs) I am the queen of adding things onto my to-do list. I will, I will finish a task. I'll get an email that I wasn't expecting to get. I will spend 30 minutes like doing whatever I have to do. And and then when I press send, I will then (laughs) go and add that task that I just completed to my to-do list just so I could check it off. (laughs) That is crazy. Yes. Yeah. I think we do it to make ourselves feel better and more accomplished. And I like, I've talked about it before, instead of it being a to-do list, making the goal that if you are able to get it all done, that you'll feel lighter, like a ta-da list, like a ta-da, I finished it. So even shifting that mind state can help because sometimes it's this never ending list. And if it's on there for three weeks, you're not going to do it. Just admit it to yourself. Stop lying. Like that's just, that is what it is. It's not going to get done. And that's okay. That's totally okay. The sooner you accept it, the The better. Yes. The sooner you can stop feeling badly about it. I agree. (laughs) 
Okay. So I want to know your life story, but really like, how did you, what, what led you to this path? What led you to become a therapist? What led you to really want to like help women with their self-worth and confidence and relationships? So like, I think many therapists, it was a personal journey before it was a professional Mm -hmm. journey. Um, And if you've heard this if you've heard me share this before on other podcasts, you can like fast forward a couple minutes or you can listen again. You might learn something new. Uh, I had a therapist. I started when I was in seventh grade because I was getting really badly bullied. So growing up, I think I had, well, from what I was told and from what I saw in like skits and videos when I was a kid, I had that natural confidence and naturally around middle school is when usually girls get clicky. It was a little bit before that, but it really hit ahead in middle school. And my parents were like, you need to talk to somebody. And this was at a time where, therapy was not widely accepted. It was still like on the cusp of, oh, you're in therapy. Like what's wrong with you? And nowadays it's like, you're not in therapy. What's wrong with you? Like, are you okay? You're just raw dogging reality. Like not, no one's guiding you through life. So I started therapy and that relationship, even some weeks, that was like the only thing that I was really looking forward to. Like I was in a really dark place during my, like when puberty hit and my hormones shifted, that depression came in real strong, plus the bullying. And so being transformed by that hour or two a week that I got with my therapist, learning more about mental health and learning more about how to heal myself from the inside out with and without therapy is when I was deciding what career to take. I was like, should I be a doctor? Because my mom's a doctor and I like helping people. Like no matter what career I picked, it was really about helping people. But then when I realized after grad school or after college, I was like, I really don't want to go to like take the GMAT and all this other, whatever the MCAT, any of those alphabet acronym tests. I was like, what am I already qualified to do that people have said I'm very good at. And I would actually enjoy doing like that Ikigai Japanese, like something you can get paid for something you're good at something Mm -hmm. that brings purpose to the world and you're passionate about. And I was like, that's it. So I started grad school right after college. I think I was like 21 when I started my doctorate and it was like the rest was history. I wanted to get done as soon as possible and not literally get my hands on some clients, but like, I really wanted to start helping people. And I remember my, when I was sitting with my first clients, I had done like research in other positions before. And I was like, this is what I meant to do. So it felt so, I, I'm very lucky that I knew what I wanted to do from such a young age. And I never had a doubt in my mind. And it was never a question of, will I get hired or will I not? Because as soon as I could, I opened my own practice and my own businesses. So it's, it's, it was cookie cutter, but I think I had put in so much of the extra bullshit and work when I was younger. Like some people have to do that in their like twenties before they get to their thirties. I did all that in my like teens. So in my twenties and thirties, it wasn't a problem. So I feel very blessed that it was, it was still trying at times, but it was a much easier career path. Cause I never had that chapter of my life where I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? I've always known. Right. Yeah. Well, the world is a much better place because you did not want to take tests that yes. had a few letter words. In- yes. <laughs> in them. yes. So. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, that. Yeah. And I, it's so funny. Like I, I totally relate to your experience with like having to go through school, but just being like, I want to skip to the part where I can help people. Yes. Like that's what yes. you're here for. And yes, we have to learn. You have to like write papers and do essays and listen to lectures and stuff. Like all you really want to be doing is pressing is fast forward and then yep. pressing play when you can actually be like face to face with somebody helping them through in the way that someone helped you through. Yes, exactly. And, and to know what it feels like to be both in the chair and on the couch is an invaluable, it's priceless. Yeah. And I think more therapists, I know the APA for psychologists requires you to go to your own therapy Unfortunately, oh, yeah, I didn't the, know that. for, for license, as far as my research has shown for LMFTs and LCSWs, unless it's a requirement in your schooling, it's not a requirement for your licensure. Like the board doesn't require it of you. Uh, cause we were through the BBS, not the, um, APA, I think it is, or the BOP, the board of psychology, duh, <laughs> more acronyms. Um, if you're not comfortable with acronyms, don't be a therapist. <laughs> I'll just say that to anyone listening. who's like, that sounds like a cool career path. There are so many to, to think of. You're not required to go to therapy. And I remember being in grad school and some people being like, oh, I've never been. And I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, and it's just not for me. And I was like, it's not like a new dish that you don't want to try. Like you're literally going to devote your life to this potentially. Like that's how I saw the career. It's like, this is my life's work, my mission in life. I want to make sure I'm, I'm taking care of myself. And it's not to say there's other career paths. I'm sure that if you're like a heart surgeon, you don't have to have had heart surgery to be a good heart surgeon, but it sure helps with your bedside manner. 
when they come in and they're like, oh, the books say this, but you know, when I went through it and the person's like, oh my God, you survived it. Like to see somebody who's gone through it and to have clients and I'm, I'm more open than I think most therapists are. I still have a lot of boundaries, but I'm more open with, if they ask a question of like, oh, have you ever dealt with this? I usually answer like, yeah, you're definitely not alone in that. If it's helpful, I can share mine. If not, I can share like what I've learned from clients. And they usually are like, yeah, just tell me what's relevant. And then we go from there. It's not, I'm using, I'm not using other people's therapy as my therapy, which I think is a huge risk. And we see that rampant all over social media. Now, one person Mm -hmm. goes to therapy and shares their advice or feedback from their therapist with everyone. And they're like, oh my God, do I have that too? And it's like, oh my God, no, like stop diagnosing each other I know online. I, know. I like that it's more widely known and therapy's cool now, but it's also a lot of cleanup work for us when we have a client come in. So I saw this TikTok and I'm always like, what is it now? <laughs> what that is it up? And <laughs> what bothers me so much is how, and we'll get to dating guys, I promise. Yes. But, um, <laughs> what bothers me so much is how easily people throw out these terms. Like, like, oh, like I'm so manic right now. Or yeah, I've yep. been disassociating all yep. week. It's like, yeah. no, you're not. Like you're, you're actually not. Clinically and, untrue. Yeah. And that's so problematic for people who actually are. Mm-hmm. It takes away, in some ways it makes the it makes society more open to hearing those terminologies and not immediately shunning it. And in other ways, it can take away the voice of people who truly are going through that. And I wrote a post the other day. It was very ironic. I wrote a post and somebody was like, do you see a lot of overlap between people with ADHD and avoided attachment? And I was like, I don't, first of all, I really don't like labels. Like, I think if it helps you to feel like you can do research on yourself, great. But I wouldn't go around being like, I'm a this, that, so-and-so, what Mm -hmm. have you. Like, I don't define myself with labels for the most part. Um, unless it's in a professional setting and somebody asked that I was like, obviously I'd say I'm a therapist, but I wasn't, I wasn't born and the doctor's like, it's a therapist. Like that was something right. I chose along the way. And somebody <laughs> messaged in and she imagine, wait, that's right. Hilarious Could you imagine that? if it's like a sorting hat, but your doctor, when you're born, it like chooses the career for you. It's like a Harry Potter. Crossover. It's an accountant. <laughs> yeah. You're like, it doesn't strike me as an accountant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh God, That'd be that's really cool. Really funny. Yeah. And this woman, um, this therapist messaged in and she's like, well, what do you mean you don't like late? And I, I don't reply to a lot of the stuff I get because I'm like, I don't have time for this. I don't, if I don't get paid for it now at this point in social media, I'm not going to be arguing back and forth with somebody in my messages. Not going to happen. I need, or I need you to ingrain that yeah. concept into my brain. I just, I, I don't. If, if, if it is not going to, if I'm not going to think about it, obviously I'm thinking about it now, but if I'm not going to think about it in a week, I don't spend my time on it for the most part. And she messaged in and was like, but I'm a this, this, that therapist. And I'm like, labels work for you, like good for you, but you're literally proving my point why hearing this kind of information is usually so activating for people who have lived their whole life underneath a label. You can have something and it not be your whole identity. Same thing with, I mean, that's a good segue for attachment styles. I was very anxiously attached. I didn't know it at the time. I learned about it mostly in retrospect and it still flares up is what I call it from time to time. But I'm otherwise very secure now, unless I'm like sleep deprived, haven't eaten, oh, you know, some sort of biological marker is off, then my 14 year old self is far more likely to come out. But I know that now. And had I only stuck with, I'm so anxiously attached, I'm so this, when I tried to be secure, my body would be like, what are you doing, bitch? Like, you're lying. We are anxious. Don't try and act like you're not bothered by this. You have to be able to let go of the labels as much as you were able to define yourself by them. And a lot of people struggle with either finding something that's accurate, like attachment wise, that fits what they are experiencing. And once they find it, they don't want to get rid of it or they don't, they like labeling other people. Well, everybody I date is avoidant. I'm like, could it be also that some part of you is avoidant? They're like, yeah. And then like, it ends up coming out. But at the beginning, they're like, no, no. Yes, well, that is rude. <laughs> How did you, as somebody who was anxious attached, end up in a healthy, yes, long term relationship? Yes, uh, th- therapy, top of the <laughs> list. Uh, doing a lot of work on self worth because, in my what I have found in anxious attachment, one of the biggest pendulum swings that we go through uh, is I'm too much. I'm not enough both internally to our own self and externally in relation to other people, if we are finding that that's what we're seeking out, if I'm operating under the worldview that I am too much or I am not enough, it would make sense why I would end up picking people who confirmed that belief about myself. 
it wasn't a fault of their own. It wasn't a fault of mine. It's not a fault. It's an attribution more so that I didn't feel worthy. I lacked self-worth in some areas, especially in dating. And so I settled for whatever I could get. Oh, at least they're validating me. At least they're giving me attention. So I shifted away from that narrative. And I remember I dated this, I dated, <laughs> I've, I've kissed a lot of frogs. I remember leaving one of a very, very bad, very bad relationship. And the next person, I took a lot of time to heal. The next person I dated after that, parents were still married, super secure. And I was like, I'm going to fuck it up. Like once he finds out that I have this past, he's not going to love me. Like, and this was in adulthood. Like it really was racking my brain. And I remember sharing a lot of that. And he was like, cool. Like was totally fine. I was like, wait, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm not too much or not enough. So in part, I had to away. believe it. Yeah. And in part, I had to hear it from somebody else. I almost had to get like permission. That's not the case for everybody, but it sure helps to have it reaffirmed. And that's when I started to shift like, oh, I have to, the best person I have to convince is me. It's not anybody else. I don't have to convince somebody else I'm good enough. I have to believe and realize I'm already good enough. There's not more yeah. work to be done. There's not more books to read. There's not more therapy weekend workshops to try. Like, it can start now. You can start adopting the belief that you are enough, even if it feels like bullshit at first today. And that's how you, that's how I worked my way into a very successful and secure relationship. We're building a family together. Like there's no doubt in my mind that this person is the person for me. Obviously we have some conflicts, but we don't, ever lose respect for one another in those conflicts. And that's how I also know it's secure because we'll approach it like, wait a second, this was my bad in this part. This is what, like, we are very vocal and communicative when it comes to what is great about our partnership, as well as what areas we need to work on. And those are traits about us specifically. And we met later in life and we know each other. So we're not right. willing to change those things. And that helps too, to be secure, knowing here's who I am, here's who I'm not. If you want this version of somebody I'm not the one <laughs> like I'm the one if you want this person I'm not the one if you want me you're not gonna change me I've already changed myself enough and changed back to who I truly am I'm not gonna go back to being a fake version of myself I'm laughing because I, I had an experience the other night with my fiance Jake and I asked him to do something and he was like, I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, yeah. but why not? And he's like, know who you're marrying. Like, yep. and I was like, you're right. Like, yep. yes. and it was literally about like brushing Barkley's teeth. Yes. Yeah. But, like that was never going to be something that Jake was ever going to like take the initiative to do yep. because I'm the one who like grew up with the dog and like yep. Barkley was mine and then also became his. And yeah have I, did I ever brush my other dog's teeth? No, I've never brushed dog's teeth in my life, but if there were going to be somebody yeah. who would initiate this, yeah. it would be me. And exactly. that's okay. Yes. But, but I there's thought that this was expectation. Like, yeah. It's so good though, that he like, he, it's like a, a check. He like checked you on yeah. it and you're like, hmm, but that's not what I built my mind in my mind in the right. conversation. You said yes. And then you take it over and then I have to worry about right. it. So can you just like relearn your lines, babe? Like what yeah. script did you get? Because that's not, yeah, exactly. and I do the same thing with my husband. It's so funny. Cause we'll go back and forth and it'll be like, well, I want you to do this. He's like, it's not going to happen. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to really but. need you to change your answer on that one. And he was like, no. And I'm like, no. He's like, why would this, I ever do yeah. that? Like, that's, like, not, that's me. not who I am. Exactly. That's, and so I'm like, that wasn't right. in my, my I job description. <laughs> I respect that. And I, I give him a lot of props because being with a therapist who does psychoanalysis is so like, He's like, not everything has to have a deeper meaning. And I looked at him and he's like, that also doesn't have to. And I was like, mm, yeah, too late, too late. You already said it. Not so the fact that you don't think that also lets me into your psyche. He's like, enough. And my therapist is like, okay, sometimes he's going to be right. And as much as it pains me to, no, I'm totally fine admitting it. And that's another part of the secure relationship. I have no problem admitting when I'm at fault. And I have no problem also yeah. kindly pointing out when it's not that he's at fault necessarily, but it's more like, I need you to own this. Like we'll, we'll have communications because we have a dog as well as, you know, scheduling wise, it's like, well, can you drop them off? Can you pick them up? And it's like good prep for kids. Um, cause I'm, I'm due in December. So we have a baby on the way also. So there's like this, a lot of changes happening, which are super exciting, but it's good prep because we have to have those discussions and to be in a secure partnership where I don't worry about asking, Hey, this needs to get done. Hey, can you go to the vet? Hey, can you make this appointment? What have you? And to know it just gets done because he is secure, that also helps. Like I'm more secure because I found someone secure. I didn't try and rein in an avoidant and tame a wild Mustang to prove my worth. Like I would prove it at work and I would also prove it because I would date like 
the most avoidant, like knuckle tattoos, had probably killed someone with his bare hands type of guy. And like once I tamed him and he was like, I'll be yours forever. I was like, I don't want you anymore, though, because you are not as edgy and unavailable. And now right. I've seen behind the curtain and we can't be together any longer. And he's like, that's so fucked up. But he he told me one time he was like, I feel like you adopted an abused dog from the dog shelter. And once you like cared for it enough that it was well enough to get adopted, you like you're done raising it. He had his own other issues. He was like a diagnosed narcissist. So we're not going to give too much empathy when it comes to that. But that was him being able to vocalize. That's how it felt really let me into my own pattern of yeah. trying to be Belle from Beauty and the Beast. I'll yeah, love you no matter what. All, yeah. And I was like, I wanted that for me. I was projecting onto other people the treatment I really wanted to receive. And once I yeah. realized that, that's really what changed the game that I could give that to myself. I didn't have to wait for someone to give it to me. I love that. And I think that is so beautiful what you just said, because I think so many of us, we feel like, and this is something that I always said when going through breakups or situationships that ended, I'm like, but I have so much love to give and I want to give it to you. Like yes. I will do anything for yes. you. I will be there for you. Yes. I will help you through whatever. Like I'm, I'm here for you. Like, why is that not enough? Yeah. And it's that I, I needed me to actually be there for me and to be yeah. patient with me and helping me. All I wanted was to like, give my love to this person I cared about. And that wasn't a healthy dynamic at all. Cause also I was right. giving something and not receiving anything in return, which made yes. me just want to give more and more, which pushed them yes. away. Yes. But it took so many like repeated scenarios of me doing the same thing over and over to finally be like, wait a second, this is not good for me. And this is not leading me to the results that I want. Mm -hmm. And I'm not okay. Right. And I need to first make sure that I'm okay before I could ever even like get into a healthy relationship. Yes. And that brings up this phenomena of in order for like, you have to love yourself before anyone can love you. I'm mixed on that. I do Me think too. therapeutically, it makes sense that if I don't yet have a space carved out in me, a capacity to, to know what receiving love feels like, even if it's from self to self, then yeah. yes, by that definition, I don't, I couldn't have somebody else love me because I don't have a space for it on my metaphorical psychic bookshelf. I would mm -hmm. be given it. And it's like when people hold kids and they don't like kids and they're like, thank you. And they <laughs> hand it back. They're like, they're like don't do know what do to do with that. With that. That's yeah. yours. And you can keep it. And I will look at it from afar. Gross. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't have that part of you carved out, you don't have space to receive it again from yourself or another person. So once you're able to understand what receiving and, and being in love, not the romantic sense, but like being in the presence of love feels like, and you have capacity and you've developed capacity for it, then you can receive it from other people. Until that happens, you'll block it. You'll make an excuse. You'll run away. You'll avoid, you'll hold it, but play hot potato with it. Like you do have to have some level of love for yourself in order to feel worthy of another person loving you. And the key here is like to recognize it. Because so many people, you can, other people, to your point, it's like, I'm trying to love you. I'm trying to this. I remember dating another guy one time. We were sitting on the couch and I had like leaned over to give him a hug. So I was like non-sexually sitting on his lap, looking into his eyes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I just, you're so amazing. Like really just giving him a compliment, you know, words of affirmation as a, as a kid, mm -hmm. I didn't hear them enough. So naturally it's my love language as, as most things are inversely. <laughs> and he was like, I don't see myself that way. And he teared up. And I was like, okay, this makes a lot more sense because if I was, I was seeing him so positively, which is another anxious attachment. Like you see the other person so much more positively than others or yourself. Yes. He, we didn't have the same view of who he was and he was desperately trying to be the person I saw him as and knew him to be capable of. And other people saw him like that. He just couldn't see it. So he couldn't receive the love I was trying to give because he didn't feel worthy of it is what ended up being our undoing. So that and a few other things, but being able to know that you are capable of that. And that's the work that needs to be done prior to being in a partnership. That's how I recommend people move towards secure attachment. It's no one's favorite advice to hear. I have a lot of dating coaching clients. They're like, why are we talking about my parents? I'm trying to like get, like do the app. And I was like, I right. can give you any picture you want. You could have the perfect match, but if you don't feel worthy, you're going to throw it in the garbage. 
you're gonna be like, he's too hot. She's too this. They're too, like, if you're too enamored with the person and you don't feel worthy, you're going to blow it up. You're not going to feel yeah. worthy of it. So you're just going to be like, I can't do this. And it's like, you don't have a dating problem. I always joke. And my brother hates this one. But I was like, everybody could find a partner if you just settle and have no standards. Like, it's really not so, that hard. <laughs> that's so true. And that's what I try and remind my friends and my listeners when they're coming to me being like, everybody else is like with somebody like I want to be with somebody so badly. And I'm like, you could you could be with somebody. You could find somebody who you could wants be with to date literally you. just anybody. Like, yeah, you could. But yeah. is that going to be the person that you're no. happy with? That you feel exactly. fulfilled with? That you want to build a life with? No. And that person no. is worth we're working for and waiting for. And yes. yeah, like like you said, like, kiss a lot of frogs. Like yeah. you might have to, you know. Yeah. And that's okay because when you do find that person, when you are in a place to accept each other and what you both have to give. It makes it all worth it. Yes. And and to your point, had I met who I am with now at any yeah. other point, I either you wouldn't have been interested because he's too secure. I would have been like, you're like a really boring scoop of vanilla ice cream. I'd like some Rocky mm-hmm. Road, please. So that wouldn't have been good. And had I met any of the other guys I used to date now, I would also not be interested. So like either way you slice it. I had to be like timing does make a huge difference and timing in your own psyche makes a huge difference. I had to be yeah. this version of me to partner with that version of him to grow together into all the other versions we're meant to be and will eventually become. And when we're with somebody and we're so desperate, I've given the example of like a job interview, which both works for like putting your, putting your resume out there. Like I have on indeed and monster and this be on the apps, but don't be so desperate that, if you're trying to look for a job every day, you're like, why has nobody looked at my resume? Why isn't this? I'm on LinkedIn, like freaking out. It's like, it's on there. It's, it's out there. If other people want to view your resume, they will. And in dating, if you're going on a date, you can't walk to the date and be like, I need this to work. You don't understand. Like, this is my only option. The other person is going to feel that energy and be like, Mm, they want a relationship more than they want to be in it with a specific person and more that's than they want to even attractive. get to know me they don't yeah yes. they don't care they about just want me. the title or the label of the security yes. or the comfort of like i'm i'm similar in my peer group now like i have i'm i'm dating i'm engaged i'm married i have kids whatever the level is generationally so i don't feel as alone because socially like if you look at evolutionary psychology people don't like to be in the out group I don't want to be so different because back in the day and back in those times, that meant death. If you were too different in either direction, you were cut out of the herd. And that is still ingrained in us that we want to be unique, but not so unique and different. We feel like an outcast. You don't, you need to have enough people in an out group to make a new in group in social psychology. And no one wants to feel like the last to do something unless it's a really icky thing like the, the being the last of the one to have kids is a totally different thing because you hear all the night positive but also horror stories that you're like I think I'm good actually I could wait yeah, on that. at that Sounds point you may not, you're not gonna yeah. be the last because you're not gonna do it <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I imagine because I get asked this a lot this concept of right person wrong time I imagine uh, that based on everything you said you yeah. do not believe in that I I that's a tough one as I like life that's a thinker I want to say, like you mentioned earlier, it's mixed. I do think you can meet to to my to the point we just made. I, and your fiance's name is Jake. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you and Jake talked about as well. If you had met at another point, it may not have come to fruition. I think in those terms, like if you're able to finally meet the secure person and you hear each other's pasts and like journeys, then yes, you could look at right person, wrong time because you're with the right person. But at any other point, it may have been the wrong time. It's something, though, that people use for comfort that might be a false sense of security that, oh, well, if if they just weren't doing this, if they just weren't about to move or this career, then maybe it could have worked out. And they're like pining over the person. Then I don't think that that's a helpful um, trope societally to fall into. And I I think that's the biggest use case for it is like justifying why it didn't work out, but trying to, you know, say, well, they like you're you're holding on to it even more by saying that. Yes. And you're building more people. And this is something we talk about a lot in analysis. You're often holding this fantasy projective version of the Mm -hmm. partner instead of being in a relationship with the real person in front of you. And the key difference there is if I'm fantasizing and projecting and interacting with an unrealized version of that person that may never be realized, 
I am not in reality. And so anything right. this person does that might uh, bring reality closer into the frame, I'm going to fight against it. People show you who they are and they tell you who they are. And if you are too caught up in your fantasy, you rewrite that. Well, they said this, but what they really meant was this. So then the ring is going to be here now. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, he literally said he never wants to have kids or be married. But maybe if he loves me enough, carry the two, we move to Texas, this, like, it's not going to happen. And people yeah. comfort themselves with a kind of a band-aid, if you will, guarding against popping that blister of sometimes it's the other person and sometimes it's you. Like, sometimes there is something about you that needs to change if you have seen, it's a big caveat, if you have seen that same theme and undoing in multiple yes. relationships. It, it's not like one time this happens and the person's like, oh, I don't like that you're a therapist. I'd be like, okay, fuck off. Like nobody else has had a problem with it. Clearly this is individual to us. But if it's the person's like, you you are overly emotional. It sounds like you need to work on your anxiety, what have you. If you're getting similar feedback from multiple people you've dated chance, and they've never met each other, <laughs> chances are that's pretty strong data to analyze. That's not just everybody making it up and like secretly meeting behind your back, <laughs> faking exactly. the reason why they're dumping you. Yeah. For, for me, it was always, I really like you, but I'm not looking for anything serious right now. And that's, and, a, that's a trend, right? Look at who yeah. you're dating. Probably they might've been young, career right. driven in the future, avoidant, who knows? Exactly. And yeah. in my imagination, this is like, like you said, like we become so creative and write this whole different yep. narrative, but I feel like we, people love to joke. Like I see this all over TikTok and Instagram now, like, oh yeah, like I've been dating the same guy in different fonts for years. Uh -huh. And yep it's actually like a problem where yeah. if you're realizing that, and if you can say that, or if a friend is saying it to you, or you and your friends are joking about it at brunch, yep. like you actually have to look into that and think yes. about it because that right there, like that is a sign. Like people also obsess over red flags. Like that is a waving flag, not yep. about somebody else, not about this situation, but like about you that you need yes. to address yes. and think about. And that pattern it's not about, I, I've joked before, cause some of my clients, I'll, if they date the guy with the same name, I call it brand loyalty, <laughs> but they'll date the guy in or girl in different forms. What is it about those traits? I, I separate it from the, the human, the name, what are these traits? And I give this really in depth, it's like a 10 page relationship inventory when I work with my clients and it's like, very intensive. And some of them are like, this is inundating. I can't do this in one sitting. And I'm like, that's why we were together for more than a few months. Like take your time with it. Noticing what are those themes who initiated? Were you initiating every single time? Were they initiating every single time? Was there a huge age gap? Was one of you more in pursuit of the other? Like I love pattern recognition and systems and you need to go in and see that in your own life. If everyone you date never was looking for something serious. First, look at the timeline of when you're dating because guys in their, or like obviously late teens, but I would say to like early thirties, that kind of decade, one of my mentors, um, what she calls it is like being in that night phase. They're all about fun and adventure, gallivanting around. They don't want to settle down. Like anything in the name of fun and adventure, that's not where women are at in that time period, societally or biologically for the most part. Obviously we're more career driven now, but deep down, there are parts of us that are like partnership. Like we can't be with right. you without deep partnership. It's very difficult for women to keep things surface and casual. As much as we can work towards it, there is parts of us, there are parts of us that are ingrained to lock it down, potentially have a child, etc. And that's from evolution. So looking at it, there's a mismatch. If I'm in my early twenties and everybody I was dating wasn't looking for something serious, that's probably more a sign of the times. If I'm in my 30s, 40s, and then this is the continuing theme, that is really when you want to look inward also and go, okay, what is it about those traits that is sparking in me that I'm both attractive to and attracted to that kind of person? There's clearly some dynamic magnet magnetism that I'm seeking that out far beyond the life phase where it's normal to not want something serious. Totally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think yeah, like you said, like it's okay if you're post grad in your early twenties and you just want to have fun and go up with it. people and date around. Like, there's yeah. literally nothing wrong with that nope. at all. Yep. What what I say to that is just make sure that the person on the other side of the table on your date is aware of that. Yes, and that you're vocalizing it and not playing cool girl or cool dude. Oh, I just yep. I'm, I want something casual, and I, that was one of my biggest undoings. <laughs> I want something casual because I thought that's what he wanted me to mm. say. 
Um, yeah. And I actually was committed to that at first. I think the birth control helped. And many moons ago, I was going into law enforcement instead of therapy. That could be a whole other episode. I was doing like a career shift. So I was much more avoidant. I was in my ice queen phase, as my friends called it. I didn't care. I was like very ruthless. I also just wasn't respecting men that much, which is another journey yeah. that a lot of women are currently on right now. Um, but I, I think shifting out of that, I eventually like fell in love and I told him, I had to tell him, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, this hurts and I want something more. And you're telling me I'm hearing you, you're not ready to partner again. He had been divorced, et cetera. I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, and it, we continued to try and it was very toxic, but had I been more, had I had higher self-worth at that point, I think I would have been able to stay away as painful as it was to cut an option off. I knew I, some part of me always knew deep down, it wasn't going to be the person I would end up with. Right. And looking at, looking backwards at that, being able to be in that conversation and be vulnerable and share, honestly, like I actually do want this. I changed my mind in the beginning. I didn't want something serious, but I have to update you now that my feelings have changed. And so many people don't bother to have either the initial conversation or the updated conversation. And they're like, yeah, like whatever you want. So cool. Like, Oh, you just want to hook up with other girls and call me at 2am. I love that. I will always be available. It's like, why the, what's the line stop settling for crumbs when you want a full meal? Like yeah. if that's what you want and it doesn't negatively impact your self-esteem, Fine. do so safely, go for it. Yeah. Like, use protection, go have fun. If though deep down, that's not what you want. If you are incongruent with yourself, you're crossing your own boundaries. Why would another person not think it's okay to do the same thing? Like you're leading by example, yeah. the way you treat yourself is how others are going to treat you. Yeah, absolutely. I have no idea what we just talked about for 36 minutes. Um, <laughs> I had an entire outline of like 27 things that I couldn't wait to discuss and <laughs> don't know what we just talked about, but loved every second of it. I do want to hit a few listener questions because I think you would have a really, really great insight. The last guy I dated soft ghosted me because he wasn't ready for something serious only to debut his new girlfriend a month mm -hmm. after. And right around the time I was starting to feel better about him not being in my life. I was devastated and it left me wondering if I'm not girlfriend material, what does it take? I'm in my mid twenties. I've never had a boyfriend despite me being actively dating since I was 18. Soft ghosting, I would imagine means they had like a conversation slow fade, slow fade? okay yeah. um i resonate with this as well i call it like being the good luck chuck i can't tell you how many guys that i dated who ended up finding their like life partner or long-term partner right after we dated i think twofold uh, answer for the listener question it's what does it take it takes you doing the inner work and being very receptive to the guy who is trying to give you things on the date, whether that be like holding the door open for you, paying for the bill, like the classic tropes or meeting him where he is at. And if you are your authentic self, you might be able to see differently that it wasn't actually a good match. You maybe she's the type that wanted a relationship more than the specific person. And mm -hmm. subconsciously we can sense that. So it's not that there's anything wrong with you that he didn't choose you if it wasn't meant to be, or there were non-starters or things he noticed that he didn't maybe want to vocalize or couldn't vocalize. Like, I don't know if I can be with somebody like that. That's actually better for you to end up finding out. Yes, it sucks. And it's very painful when we see that person end up with another person. Once this person ends up finding a boyfriend, I imagine this person she dated will slowly, very quickly actually fade out of her mind and it won't be as much of a concern it's the good luck Chuck phenomena is something I have talked about on my Instagram page too. Sometimes the person who helps you realize what you want isn't the person who gives you what you want. Yeah, that's yeah. so true. I also think going back to kind of what we said or what you said in the beginning with the labels, like you don't have to yeah. label yourself as not girlfriend material. The reality is you just weren't going to be this person's girlfriend. And exactly. That and that's okay. You know, you're not, you're not going to be for everyone, just like everybody's not going to be for you. And mm -hmm. so I guarantee this guy, even though he's dating someone new, when he ended things with you or slow goes to do yeah. whatever, yeah. he wasn't thinking like, oh, like Talia's not girlfriend yeah. material. Right. So like, it was nice to go on a few dates with her, but I'm going to go find the girlfriend. It, yeah. it just, it was just like not a fit. There was something that wasn't there or was there that they weren't looking for. And yep. you're just not going to be a fit with everybody. And I know it's frustrating year after year trying to find your person. And 
similar things happening or, or you just not finding them, but you will, like you have to yes. believe that you will. And there's nothing yes. wrong with you. The right no, person will wrong with you. love you for you. And maybe make the goal less about, I need to make this person my boyfriend. I know it's very hard biologically. And like, I, I talk yes. about that a lot too, but look at dating as the first date is a decision. If, if I want to go on a second date and then so on exactly. and so forth and keep your eyes open to, am I getting what I need to get? And am I able to give what I need to give for this to continue yes. till it's meant to continue? That could be forever. That could be three dates. So stop tying it to be like, I have to make this person my boyfriend into like, do I like them rather than do Absolutely. they like me? You yeah. do, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you do like coaching with Heath Bull surrounding like finances and money as well, yes. right? Yes. Okay. I pulled a question specifically for that. So cool. I'm excited to have you here. Yay. Somebody said, what are your thoughts on dating while poor? I quit my job two years ago to work on my own thing. And I've started feeling insecure about asking anyone out now. I've been in long-term relationships with two girls since quitting. And my lack of money was always in the back of my mind. And it can lead to some anxiety on my side. As a guy, I still feel it's my responsibility to pay for dates. While I've never been stingy, a date night in a big city could easily go over a hundred dollars. Not to mention going to big events like concerts and sporting events. Should I continue to put dating on hold until I'm more finan financially stable? I don't want to go on dates and tell somebody I don't have a job and then think I'm a bum. Am I blowing this out of proportion? I just feel bad about dragging someone down. So I would um, definitely give the feedback that if there's any part of him that views himself as a bum or that believes he is dragging people down, then that's going to come true. Like he will end up inadvertently manifesting or picking somebody who confirms that because that's something he needs to look inward at. If you are, if you eventually want to be more of the like career driven provider, et cetera, like you, you know, talked about for yours, it's like, I lost my job or I quit my job. I don't have a job and I'm in the interim of, do I get another one or not? What am I going to do? If you want to wait until you feel more like a provider, financially stable and established, the type of woman that you're going to be attractive to and attracted to will change. So mm -hmm. if you're wanting it to, to be like the next chapter where you're more stably dating, then yes, it would make sense to wait. It doesn't mean you have to not date at all in the interim, but maybe your goal of dating is getting to know other people, getting to explore what other free options are around the city. At the core though, I, whether the woman is the provider as well or not, there is something that's hardwired in us, especially once we get pregnant and have kids that we immediately seek out. Like, are you making enough money? Do we have enough house? Do we have this? It's so hardwired in us because we want our species and our like own genetics to survive. So you're, you're kind of combating with thousands of years of evolution as well as day-to-day -day interactions. If you feel secure in it and you know that you can provide what you can provide, it might not be what others can provide. Lean into more of what you can provide rather than focusing on what currently you're unable to, to the level that you would like. Yeah. I also think, you know, I'm just staring and rereading the question and you mentioned you quit your job two years ago to work on your own thing, but then the rest of it was just about feeling like you're not enough feeling like you can't yep. give enough. Like yep, yep. other people are going to look at you poorly because of it. You did something really brave and badass, and you quit your stable job to yes. work on something and pursue something that you're passionate about. And yes. I think that's what you should focus on. And that's what you should actually like change the narrative in your mind because you did something awesome and maybe it'll work out. Maybe it won't. It's always mm -hmm. a risk. But I think if you can more focus on like you're working really hard, you're taking this big risk, it's scary, yeah. but you're so passionate about it that's something that people are going to be attracted to. And they're going to completely understand like, oh yeah, like we're not going to go to a five-star restaurant, but we can still have a five-star quality date doing something yes. really fun and connecting. Yes. And if you have a vision for whatever you're building, your whatever your own thing is, and it's coming true, lean yeah. into that. And um, Layla and Alex Hormozzi are one of my favorite like social media. I love business stuff. So I follow them she has been her like his ride or die since he was like had to live at his pair she he lived at her parents house in a different room like he was she's like i would be with you if we lived under a bridge like i don't i'm in it for you i'm not in it for the money there are people out there i'm like one of i'm like layla and matt as well there are people out there where it's not about the money is that a bonus sure because everybody needs money to survive in some way but that's not you don't necessarily want to partner with somebody who's only in it for that or who only yeah. is wanting somebody who can make X amount of money. Money is important. We need it to live, but over a certain amount, it's really superfluous. So focus yeah. on your passion, lead with that and give yourself probably a deadline. If it doesn't work out in X amount of months, 
keep it as a side project, go get something stable. So you cannot be stressing yourself out. Financial stress is one of the most um, unsexy things that we find in ourselves, like that scarcity mindset, or what if I'm poor? What if I'm a bum? You need to address that in your own therapy and rework those core beliefs before you try dating again. Otherwise it's going to sneak back up. Absolutely. Yeah. One more. I have great dates. I've been going on great dates, but the guy doesn't text in between the dates. He texts once a day or two. This creates a lot of anxiety in me. How do I address this? Uh, So women are far more affected by the written word than men. And once we go on a date with you, we are like, we're in a relationship. And we expect relationship level behavior and communication. You are not in a relationship until you're in a relationship. Sorry to tell you, but harsh truths are my um, specialty, I would say. I try to be kind with them. It is the kindest thing to yourself to understand why do I want that? What is it about constant communication that would soothe me, that would give me hope? Am I tying something to it? Like he's going to be more likely to make me his girlfriend if fill in the blank. Like you need to address your own beliefs and separate from that, understand you are far more affected by the written word. It means something to you. Men are more of the, they don't really share a lot of details. Some do. I don't want to mean to be stereotypical, but some do, some, most don't because there's not a purpose to it. I'm going to get to the point. I'm going to share what I need to share. I don't ask a lot of questions. I don't need a lot of details because I see what I need to see. I know what I need to know. So sometimes women feel this pressure or this expectation. Well, so-and-so friend had their date go, you know, and I'm like, did it end up coming true? Well, yeah, they ended up together. Great. That's one example of what could happen. But for the most part, don't put so much pressure on it. And also ask, like, did you ever tell this person I want X amount of communication between dates? Because sometimes if you set that standard from the beginning, the person's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. You don't even need to waste your time. If the other person can't give you what you you want, they're not for you. And that's not a fault of theirs, not a fault of yours. You want to find somebody who wants to give you what you want. And you need to ask this person and share what positive impact it would have if you got it, not complain about the negative impact it's having because you're not getting it. 1000%. It's so funny. I've been doing some matchmaking lately and something I am asking people is, are you a big texter or not? Just because I know how much that affects people and how- we end up self-sabotaging if we're not getting the amount of text communication that we need between the dates. Like we get so in our head, we overthink and we end up ruining what could have been a great match, but you know yep. what? That's okay. Cause if, if it's not working out, it's not working out and they're not your person. Yeah. And if you are, if this person writing in is more anxiously attached, please work on yourself and to secure yourself. Because even if somebody is texting you all day, every day, if you're the kind of person that they text off once and you're like, oh my God, what happened? You need to go to therapy. <laughs> like it doesn't matter how much the other person is reassuring you. If you're equating communication to reassurance, that is definitely a wound to heal. So that it if they text you a lot, if they text you a lot, great. If they don't text you a lot, I'm so busy living my life. I don't notice. I'm not sitting yes. there all day being like, did he text? Did he text? Did he text? That's a recipe for disaster. Go build your own life worth living and have dating be a part of it until you find somebody who you want to share more of your life with. Absolutely. Okay. Last question for you. My favorite question to ask, what is the best piece of dating or relationship advice you've ever received or have to give? I think some of the best relationship advice that I've given is to look at yourself first before you look at the other person for a flaw, for a fault, or that they're not doing something. And if you are able to tell yourself like, well, I'm upset at this person because I would have, I would, I fill in the blank. That is a strong sign that you need to do more of your own work and be introspective rather than out like outsourcing or blaming the other person. Why are you expecting that of the other person? Did you ever talk to them about this? Did they, did you talk about it? Did they agree to it? And did they fall short of an agreement is totally different than I subconsciously am expecting this for this person because I would do that. And that's what I equate to love and they're falling short. They're failing a test. They didn't even know they were taking. So that's, I would say some of the best advice that I've been, that I've given to other people. And some of the best advice that I've received is, it comes from my dad loosely translated from his his um <laughs> the way that he words it is to to pick the person it's not gonna, the the person who makes you lighten up and be softer and be like less intense if you're the more intense one that's the person for you like who you think you want might not be the actual best fit you want somebody who's going to grow you 
in the ways that it might be like, oh shit, I really do have to work on my patience, my this, my that. They're, yes, they want to amplify the great parts about you, but they should also be bringing out those shadows of you to be like, yeah, wow, you really trigger me. Like, am I, he's the human bottle of Valium. He is so even keel. I am so much more even keel because I've taken his lead and I've learned from him and I'm like, witnessing I'm like wow you're really unbothered like how do you do that whereas before I would have been like somebody else needs to be freaking out while I'm freaking out like pick the person who can compliment you and who also brings out your strengths but helps you to grow out of your weaknesses I could talk about everything you just said both the the giving and the receiving parts (laughs) yeah for literally an entire other hour. (laughs) Um, So all I'm going to say is those were incredible pieces of advice. Thank Thank you you so much for sharing them. And I, the, what you had said of me going, wanting to talk about it for an hour. Um, The like (laughs) asking yourself, like, is this something like I would do like, but we never talked about it or we, there was no expectation that they would do that. I've actually never heard anybody say that. And I think that is so wise and so insightful and something that, we all could do a much better job at. Yep. We all need to check ourselves where our expectations of how other people should or shouldn't behave come from. And once you really understand part of it's biological, part of it's your family system and what you expected based on the system you grew up in, you can really free yourself and understand that like people have their own autonomy and you can choose to interact or react to it. You don't have to be so impacted. Well, why are they this? Why are you bothered by it? And my yeah. clients hate, they hate and love. They're like, fuck you. And I'll see you next week. And I'm like, love you too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we well, should do a whole other you. episode if you want. I'm all, I Down. can talk. I love my own voice. Obviously I have three podcasts, so I'll talk to anyone about anything. <laughs> Any day, anytime. Absolutely. Yes. Cool. I can't wait. Perfect. Talia, thank you so, so much for being You're here. Welcome. Where can everybody find you? Um, Instagram and TikTok are both at Talia Bombola, so my name. And then I have my podcast, Heal Through Humor, uh, Between Two Clinicians with Adam Luke, and then the Couples Guide podcast with Ryan Hill. Those are, I think, my main platforms. And those are like all over social media and um, YouTube as well if people want to watch the episodes. And we will have all of that linked in the show notes. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Please, please, please send this episode to a friend who would love to hear it. Share it with the group chat. Share it with your coworkers. Send it to your therapist. Why not? Maybe they have someone who wants to hear it. Put it on your story. Tag us. (laughs) Tag Talia. And I'll talk to you guys next time. (laughs) Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening, daters. I hope today's episode made you feel just a little bit less alone out there, no matter what your status might be. Give your finger a break from swiping and hit that follow and review button instead. And if you have any burning questions or want to share your own dating horror stories, reach out to seeingotherpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. And in the meantime, keep on seeing other people.